Christians, Question the Honorable Leader of the Opposition. with record high inflation, and it's clear these Liberals have no plan to deal with it responsibly, except more of the same mismanagement that got us here in the first place, out-of-control spending. Even financial institutions like Scotiabank have warned that their continued spending drives higher inflation. You can't spend inflation away. Isn't it true, Mr. Speaker, life is continuing to get worse, not better for Canadians under these Liberals, and they have no idea how to deal with it? The Honourable Minister for Tourism. Mr. Speaker, I thank the Honourable Leader of the Opposition for her question. And that side ran on a platform to spend even more deficit spending than we did. On this side, we have an affordability plan, Mr. Speaker. We created the Canada Child Benefit, which is right now putting $13,666 into the pockets of a single mother with two kids. We have indexed OAS and are increasing it. We are making sure there is a $500 home credit for people struggling with housing. Mr. Speaker, no plan plan for affordability on that side, a clear plan on this side. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Well, one idea is to reduce federal taxes at the pump to help ease the high cost of gas. Provinces are doing it, other countries are doing it, even the U.S. is considering doing it. What did the Liberals say when we made this suggestion? They said no. Whether it's lowering taxes on gas or things like removing restrictions and mandates, these Liberals always say no to good ideas. Mm -hmm. Why are the Liberals always so slow and reluctant to do the right thing when it comes to helping Canadians? The Honourable Minister. The Honourable Minister of Natural Resources. Here we are, of course, doing the right thing. That means actually working to address the supply constraints that have evolved since the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Canada has committed to increase its production of oil and gas by 300,000 barrels by the end of the year. We are working in partnership with our friends in the United States, with Brazil, and with a number of other countries to stabilize global energy prices and to ensure that we are actually addressing affordability on a go-forward basis. The Leader of the Opposition. Speaker, under these Liberals, murders are at a 30-year high. We're seeing shootings and death increase. This weekend in Toronto is another sad example. But we shouldn't be surprised. The same minister who's busy misleading Canadians on the Emergencies Act is the one in charge of public safety. Liberals implementing gun bans while at the same time letting violent criminals into our communities is illogical and dangerous. Why won't these soft on crime Liberals do something to protect our streets and start by making sure gangsters and drug dealers stay behind bars? The Honourable Minister for Public Safety. Speaker, if that member had actually read Bill C-21, she sees that we're taking organized crime head-on by raising maximum sentences for illegal gun smugglers. She'd see that we're addressing the alarming concerns around handgun violence by introducing a national handgun fr fr uh, freeze. She'd see that we're also addressing the alarming trend around the connection between intimate partner violence as well as with guns by the introduction of red flag log, uh, red flag log, log <laughs> protocols, uh, Mr. Speaker. And the only thing Conservatives can offer is making AR-15 assault-style rifles legal again. They should come to this chamber with more ideas. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. The Liberals, if you commit a crime with a gun, you get to do your time at home. How is that protecting communities, exactly. Mr. Speaker? Exactly. But you know what? Everything these Liberals touch is a disaster, whether it's the soft on crime and often misunderstood public safety minister, or a heritage minister who's taken away Canadians' online freedoms, or a minister of foreign affairs who invites her delegates to party with the Russians, or a finance minister trying to spend her way out of inflation. It's all a disaster, Mr. Speaker. Isn't it true? Canadians are much worse off today than they were seven years ago, and it's all because of their terrible liberal policies. The Honourable Government House Leader. Mr. Speaker, as we, uh, we near the session, I understand that the party opposite is continuing to try to obstruct and search and uh, cast dispersions in a number of different places. The reality is, over the last seven years, uh, we have seen uh, our economy grow. We've seen uh, our, uh, the investments that have been made across the board to help lift Canadians up. We've seen a record number of Canadians be lifted out of poverty. We're way ahead of our poverty reduction targets. This government continues to be 
focus, Excellent. Mr. Speaker, on delivering results for Canadians. I understand that the opposition is searching for attack lines as they troll from subject to subject to subject. We stay focused on getting things done for Canadians. Mr. Speaker, we're still waiting for results. Let's summarize. The Liberal government's response to the cost of living, the Minister of Finance announced with great fanfare she'd do nothing. Gas prices are at historic highs. The Minister of the Environment is pleased. Citizens camp outside Passport Canada offices. The Minister didn't anticipate that after two years of a pandemic, Canadians would want to travel. The, the list goes on and on. It's time to end this spiral of chaotic Liberal incompetence. Who will have the courage to stand up the Prime Minister? The Honourable Minister for Tourism. When it comes to affordability for Canadians, it's clear that on the government side, we've created the child tax benefit and the Conservatives voted against. We set up supports for the tourism sector. The Conservatives voted against them. We have been here to support seniors, workers, single parent families. The Conservatives vote against it. The economy is in full swing. We're here to help Canadians. The Conservatives are just uh, trying to get some snappy lines for Twitter. The federal fiasco is becoming dangerous. At this point, the police have had to intervene in lineups at passport offices. And they're not just managing people's anger, they're answering questions on behalf of federal employees. Enough with this. A crisis can't be managed from 8 to 4, Monday to Friday. How is it possible that offices are not open seven days a week with extended hours? We're in a state of crisis. When will this government wake up? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the Honourable Member for his question. As we are all aware, after two years of travel restrictions, Canadians are travelling again, and there's increased demand and volume for for passports, and that's why the focus of the minister and officials has been to make sure that Canadians do receive their passports. This is why we are triaging lines at every Service Canada location in met urban and metropolitan areas. That is why we've increased our staff by over 600 to serve Canadians, and that's why we've added additional resources to our MP lines and to other call-in lines to ensure that we reach Canadians and that they get the documents they need. Thank you, Mr. Thank Speaker. The Honourable Member for La Prairie. While the government's not doing its job in the passport offices, MPs are being inundated with calls for help from citizens. On Friday, all MPs' offices were notified, or rather our offices were notified, that the federal government was cutting services to elected officials intervening to help people get their passports. Imagine that they're doing nothing to help people, and now they're preventing us from helping them instead. Then, we found out this morning that that email was a mistake. What amateurishness. People are paying for the minister's incompetence, and it is unprecedented. When will they stop improvising, making it up as they go, and open their offices evening and weekends until the crisis is finally resolved? Three secretary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to thank the honourable member for his question and all of the colleagues in this house who are advocating for constituents who have urgent travel needs. Mr. Speaker, employees from Service Canada have worked tirelessly throughout this pandemic to serve Canadians, and they've been performing their services overtime and every weekend. As a matter of fact, on the June 24th and July 1st long weekend, employees will be working to make sure that Canadians receive their documents. In addition to that, Mr. Speaker, with regards to the MP line, an additional 50 resources have been added, with another 40 being trained to make sure that we can address the increased demand and volume to assist those constituents. Mr. Speaker, we are here to serve Canadians together in this house. Thank you. Oh boy, Mr. Speaker, that's not reassuring. Listen, Mr. Speaker, life is getting more and more expensive. Families are on the verge of losing their homes. Children are going to school hungry. The crisis is hitting hard and families are paying the price. The Liberals answer a $7 tax credit. $7! They couldn't be more out of touch. This is a slap in the face to workers, seniors, to children. People need help. The NDP has proposed solutions. Will the Liberals double the GST tax credit and increase the child benefit to actually help struggling families? The Honourable Minister of Tourism. Mr. Speaker, what the NDP is putting forward is insincere and false. If we just look at the... Canada Child Benefit, 
A single parent family will receive $660 more. That's not $7. It's more than $1,300. Now, when it comes to daycare services in Edmonton, a mother or father can get $10,000. It's not $7. It's $10,000. They should check their facts and not make things up for the house. Wood Trans Kona. Mr. Speaker, they keep talking about things that they were doing or should have been doing before inflation struck. The fact is, Canadians are worried about losing their homes, they're worried about feeding their families, and the Liberal plan is another $7 on the GST rebate. That's not a plan, that's a talking point for a government that's more concerned about inflation as a public relations problem than it is about an economic problem. A real plan would provide served debt relief, double the GST rebate, increase the Canada Child Benefit. So when is the Deputy Prime Minister going to kindly announce that plan? Here, here, Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, it's disappointing that the NDP continue to push this cynical and frankly disingenuous narrative that somehow Canadians are only getting $7 more in affordability supports. They know very well, Mr. Speaker, that in my own city of Edmonton, child care benefits $10,000 this year. And the Canada Child Benefit, Mr. Speaker, in Vancouver, a mother with two children, $13,666. That's a lot more than $7, Mr. Speaker. The NDP need to stop playing for political points and tell the whole story. Story. The Honourable Member for Central Okanagan, Similkameen Nikolai. Mr. Speaker, the Finance Minister must be wearing industrial-grade noise-cancelling earphones to avoid hearing the calls from economists to cut her government's over-the-top spending. She knows that it's only adding gas to the inflationary fire. The Prime Minister has said that anything that has a hint of fiscal restraint is austerity. He asked Bill Morneau for wanting to get post-COVID spending under control. Is she worried that if she presents anything to the Prime Minister, the room Remotely resembles a cut that she might suffer the same fate of her predecessor, who went from finance minister more no to finance minister no more. Oh. The Honourable Minister of Tourism. Mr. Speaker, let's take a look at the facts. The Conservatives ran on a platform to spend $168 billion. I'm glad they didn't get elected. That would have been simply irresponsible. But let's look at the economy, Mr. Speaker. Let's look at the fact that we have a GDP that grew 5.6% in Q1. This fall, again, S&P and Moody's affirmed our AAA credit rating. 3.5 million jobs recovered since the worst part of the pandemic ahead of the United States and the lowest unemployment rate at 5.1% since 1976. The economy is doing well. The Conservatives don't like it, but we sure do. The Honourable Member for Central Okanagan, Smilkmi Nikola. Keep trying to change the channel, but these spendy peas, these spendy pea liberals don't, won't, or can't understand that their obsession with spending is fueling inflation and hurting Canadians. Doug Porter, chief economist at BMO, said fiscal policy has every bit as much a role to play in dampening inflation as does monetary policy, and fiscal policy should definitely not get a pass in the inflation fight. Conservatives have been saying cut discretionary spending, That's give right. Canadians a break at the pumps. Those are good starting points. The question is, when will this Minister of Finance stop fueling inflation and instead start fighting it? The Minister of Tourism. The uh, members of the opposition and that member in particular to vote with us the next time we have a piece of legislation in this house that's actually designed to improve the lives of Canadians and make their lives more affordable. The Conservatives have voted against every single measure that we put on the floor of this house to make life more affordable, Mr. Speaker, including C2, including the Canada Child Benefit, including making sure that OAS payments are indexed. Mr. Speaker, they are all talk, no action. On this side, we're focused on affordability for Canadians. Mr. Speaker, the number one subject of concern to every Canadian is inflation, and this Liberal government is responsible for increasing it. It's not just the Conservatives saying it. Yesterday, Scotiabank's chief economist, Jean-François Perrault, said the government's high level of budgetary expenditures is leading to an unnecessarily large decrease in private spending. In short, the government doesn't know how to manage, and it's hurting the economy. Is this government finally going to be responsible when there's inflation and curb its spending? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, I wonder if the Honourable Member voted for or against the Conservative plan to have a $168 billion deficit during their election campaign. But on this side, we have made sure that the Canada Child Benefit is indexed to inflation. 
We have reduced taxes for the middle class twice. We've increased old age security and introduced a tax cut. And Conservatives are voting against Canadians and we're voting for them. The Honourable Member for Louis Saint Laurent. Mr. Speaker, at every hour, in every riding, and I'm sure it's true, in all 338 ridings, citizens are desperate and they're calling us about passports. Again, over the weekend, a nurse had to take time off instead of going to take care of six people and is waiting in line to have access to passports in Laval. Police officers had to be sent to calm the discontent of citizens. I'm proud to be a Canadian, but when I see this in our country, a G7 country, not a third world country, why did the government wait so long and end up creating this crisis? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'll thank the Honourable Member for his question. But as he is aware, as many in this House, travel restrictions being lifted, Canadians are beginning to travel again. But, this, the, but the Department did plan for it. As of September last year, over 600 new employees were added to Passport Canada services, Mr. Speaker. And in addition to that, every Service Canada office is receiving applications at this time. Every passport counter in this country is open to serve Canadians. Over 96% of applications that are processed in person are receiving their passports within 10 days. That is better than the international standards that are out there. We will continue to do everything we can to make sure Canadians receive their documents. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, to get a passport, people have to bring their tent and spend the night on the sidewalk. That's happening here in Canada, a G7 country. Nothing is going right. It used to process 90,000 requests before COVID. We need to authorize the return to work to employees on site and extend working hours in all offices. Can the minister move away from uh, her scripted lines and give us a real answer? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to remind the Honourable Member that our public servants have been working weekdays, overtime and weekends since we've been, since passport restrictions, since travel restrictions have been lifted to ensure that Canadians are receiving their passports. Over 360,000 passports have been issued since April of this year, Mr. Speaker, and just last week, for nearly 48,000 passports were issued to Canadians. We are continuing to make sure that service lines are triaged, that we're reaching seniors, people with disabilities, unique employment needs, and humanitarian and compassionate issues that require emergency documents. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the price of groceries went up by nearly 10% in April. This is the fifth month in a row where the price of food went up by over 5%. Gas is over $2 a litre across the province. In the greater Quebec City area, house pri housing prices went up by over 25, 21% over last year. With salaries increasing at about 3.3%, people are struggling. Can the Minister of Finance face Canadians and offer them real solutions? The Minister for Tourism. Mr. Speaker. The Conservatives are raising issues about affordability, whereas their party has no plan for affordability for Canadians. And every time we try to do something to make life more affordable for Canadians, they vote against it. On this side of the House, we've been helping with the Canada Child Benefit, indexed it to inflation, we've increased OAS payments, and we have made sure that payments for Daycare services will be indexed. We're working on affordability on the other side. They're really not.